Let's begin by reading the second half of chapter eight. Then I'd kind of like to make a quick digression back to Melchizedek and bread and wine, and then continue forward to uh, the second half of, section of chapter eight. So chapter eight, verse seven. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, the days will come, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I paid no heed to them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow or everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he treats the first as obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So first, something of a digression going back to Melchizedek, well, we had discussed this, and uh, just the, the discussion has sort of bothered me, and it only recently dawned on me why this was the case. When Melchizedek greets Abram, he offers him bread and wine, and the author of Hebrews makes no mention of the bread and wine. For the fathers, the bread and wine is significant as pointing forward to the Eucharist. But the author of Hebrews doesn't mention it. So the question that we discussed was why that was. Could it be the, the Septuagint Bible? Is it mentioned in that Bible? Yeah, it's mentioned in the Septuagint. So the possible reasons one is that, you know, given that it was very common to accuse Christians of, of cannibalism, of eating flesh and blood when, when uh, celebrating the Eucharist, that he didn't want to mention it. But later we'll see, near the end of Hebrews, we'll see that there's a very clear Eucharistic rest reference, although it's cast in somewhat veiled terms. But nevertheless, with some you know, cleverness, he could cast this in veiled terms. Uh, another common reason given, especially by uh, non-Catholic, non- uh, non uh, or Reformation and post-Reformation interpreters is that he's not concerned with the Eucharist at all. But can anyone think of another reason? How many priests did they have at the time? If they didn't have enough priests, we, we wouldn't want people to think that because they can't receive communion, they aren't Christian. At this early period, it's I think it's unclear exactly what the liturgical celebration is like, although in all probability, I mean the the you know early early priests and bishops were largely you know sort of appointed by popularity, so there wasn't you know there wasn't you know kind of rigorous training and whatever. Um, so, um, so there, you know, there would, 
be no need to, you know, there, there wouldn't be a shortage of priests or, or you know, presbyters or bishops or, or deacons. So what really struck me is that, so we have Melchizedek and in some sense, he's a type of Christ, but really a very, I guess you could say shallow copy. I mean, he's only a type of Christ sort of by default because nothing is mentioned of him. So he dies, but because his death isn't mentioned, he lives forever. He is without genealogy, not that he's actually without genealogy, but he's without genealogy because it's not mentioned. He's without father or mother, not because he's without father or mother, but because his parents aren't mentioned. His death isn't mentioned. He is just sort of a shadowy figure who pops out of blue out of nowhere and then goes away again. And so he points forward to Christ without being, you know, sort of a substantial image of Christ in any way. And so the continuity that the author sees is liturgically in terms of sacrifice between the old covenant <coughs> and Christ. And so in that sense, the bread and wine isn't liturgical, it's just brought out. So it's not clearly part of an act of sacrifice. It clearly has, it doesn't, you know, appear to have any, um, you know, particular implications for the forgiveness of sin. It just happens to be bread and wine brought out by a king and a priest to give to Abraham. And so since it's not liturgical, and since it's not, you know, in any strict sense typological, it doesn't point forward to the Eucharist. It's just bread and wine. So I think I think that's probably the case. And I think that it you know sort of tends to reinforce the view that the author's fundamental <clears throat> focus is on liturgy. And on the people of God as a whole. It strikes me that in many ways, you know, kind of what I've been struggling with is that we have this very sort of individualistic interpretation of Hebrews. And the author really isn't concerned with an individualistic interpretation. He's concerned with the people of God and he's concerned with liturgy. And, and so that that's also true of you know any number of people have pointed out his apparent error in chapter seven where he says on um, verse twenty seven he has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily first for his own sins and then for those of the people he did this once for all when he offered up himself although he's talking about repeated sacrifices his focus is really on the day of atonement. And that's not a sacrifice for individual sin at all. That's a sacrifice for the collective sins of people. It's first of all a sacrifice for the collective sins of the priesthood, and then a sacrifice for the collective sins of people. So with that, we can move to chapter the second part of chapter eight. So Jeremiah says that God's law is written in our hearts. Do we really believe that? Or is that just one of those you know, sort of nice things that, that uh, we're supposed to believe? And, uh, and also, do Christians seem to really believe it? Would you repeat what, you're, what, what it is you're asking about? Jeremiah says that in the New Covenant, God's law is written in our hearts. Uh, so do we believe that God's law is written in our hearts? Or is that just, you know, kind of one of those pious platitudes that 
were supposed to be leave, but you know, kind of not many people do, sort of like 70% you know, of Catholics don't actually believe in the real presence. And then more broadly outside of Catholicism and the pre-Reformation faith traditions, does it appear that Christians believe that God's law is written in our hearts? We have many signs that they don't, if they have to be written on walls and on um, monuments. But if you watch little children, there's an innate kindness about them. Uh huh. It's written here. Right. But I think as we become adults, something happens along the way maybe even teenagers, but something happens along the way, life experiences or how you're trained at home, and that changes. But that's, that's partly the Holy Spirit um, at work, in my view. Mm -hmm. Works the good part Mary. is the Holy Spirit, not the moving away from it. Right, 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 no. Right. Right, it's, it's because of the Holy Spirit that God's law is written in our hearts. Now, to, be, to be written in our hearts, it's not written like a bright neon sign. It is very faint. You have to either listen to it or look for it and read it. But it is easy to overlook. Mm -hmm. It is easy to not hear anymore. Yet, when you're even the worst person, I would imagine, in a solemn moment, when you look back on that day, that, that day that they just lived and they did some bad things, I'm willing to bet they, the laws. That's bad. You know, I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I had, it, I, had it, I had excuses for it. But they recognize it. I just think that our human experiences are such that if it's not in the neon bulb light, you know, internally, that we will just walk past it. <laughs> that, that, uh, uh. <laughs> that that has an unfortunate element of truth. <laughs> if, it's, if it's not in a neon sign, we're going to miss it. <laughs> well, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I don't think we're tuned to the subtle things of a of a whatever you want to write with a feather. I, I think that the human life and especially in America and the rest of the world that we're not trained to sit down and meditate and think. No, no, no. It's active. It, it has to kick you in the butt or hit you in the head or do something to you. It's active, right? But the hard thing also is what it is that is written. You know, so for the Mosaic Law, it's in immediate terms the Ten Commandments, and then more broadly the Mosaic Law as a whole. Uh, which is you know, somewhat onerous, but a lot of the provisions of the Mosaic law until the, the Pharisees extended them to all believers or tried to extend them to all believers. A lot of provisions of the Mosaic law were unique to the priesthood. So it's not as onerous as it seems. But the problem with you know, discipleship in Christ is that the law is much more rigorous. It, you know, so there's an argument that Christ simplified the law by reducing it to only two commandments. But that simplification is that argument is not correct. In fact, the law under Christ is much more demanding than the Mosaic law because it requires that as disciples, we'd be 
a people of sacrifice. It also requires that we develop the ethics and the morality of the kingdom of God. And you know, that in some sense we live in the kingdom of God. And that's much harder. The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, right. Yeah, so Christ calling us to be all of the things none of us really want to be. <laughs> it's not about beliefs as much as a conversion. Right, right, right. Although in its original meaning, belief is conversion. If you, if you believe, then you ascribe to an external truth that's so compelling that you orient your life accordingly. It's only, you know, it's only in our, it's only in, from the uh, enlightenment, increasingly on that the meaning of belief has changed so that it's become subjective and it's kind of become a matter of my opinion that really never was what belief was. So written in our hearts is very challenging, but it's also true that it's written in our hearts because of the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide us. And also what's, you know, sort of unique for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest in, in Jeremiah's prophecy. Now, one of the striking things is that knowledge of God was restricted in many ways. God spoke to the prophets. He maybe spoke to some priests, but their role was really I mean, they, they weren't necessarily called to have a close relationship with God. They were called to be set apart, holy through being set apart, and holy through their liturgical worship. But that you know, didn't necessarily involve a relationship with God in any sense. And then... God spoke to the kings, or at least the good ones, or tried to speak to the kings, including the bad ones. So in, in some sense, direct knowledge of God was strictly limited. So the Holy Spirit coming upon each believer marks a major transformation marks a major change that makes it possible for the least of them to the greatest to know the Lord. What is disappointing, I, mean, I think, in terms of the law written in our hearts is that, you know, for many Christians, many Christians don't believe that and instead look to write the law, the law on stone, tablets, and things on courthouse steps and, uh, and, uh, and also make that the Ten Commandments, which is uh, the, the, the catechism says that at least the, it, actually the Ten Commandments are written in all human hearts. So particularly the first part of the Decalogue or the second part of the Decalogue it, you know, forms fairly uniformly standard of law, starting from the Hammurabi Code, which you know, from ancient Babylon that predates the Ten Commandments. And the second part, or the first part rather, of the Decalogue is written is is expressed even among non-believers in you know sort of a striving for meaning beyond life. So how does my life make a difference within the vast scheme of, of things? How do I 
achieve immortality? That's even a question that atheists ask. Through living a good life and having an impact, I can live forever. So in that sense, the Ten Commandments are written in all human hearts. So, so putting them on courthouse, courthouse steps uh, is really a misguided attempt to, uh, well, it's a misguided attempt. I'll leave, I'll leave it to your imaginations to decide what's misguided about it since I've probably already said more than enough. So with that aside, back to uh, the second half of chapter eight of Hebrews. So how does how does this relate to what's come previously? What always amazes me here is how many you know sort of backward pointers the author has in his argument and how much he's drawing on what he has previously said mm -hmm. without necessarily explicitly pointing it out. So you can't accuse him of, uh, what is the word? Understating. What? Understating his point. Understating, yeah. You also can't accuse him of, you know, like having a brain dump or being guilty of free association. You know, I mean, sometimes you can accuse Paul of that, but but certainly not the author of Hebrews. He's, he's very... Uh, weaves a very, very tight, carefully argued letter, a real masterpiece of, of uh, both literature and, and theology. So how does this relate to what's previous? Well, he goes back to the covenant, the old covenant with the fathers, and he's not saying that the old covenant was bad, but that the people for whom it was intended did not take it up. They did not follow it. So he he's sending somebody to teach them how to follow it in the new covenant. Mm -hmm. Actually say, well, yes, he does say that in the old, in the previous section, that he's sending a better priest, Christ. Or Jesus. Right. He's sending a better priest. All right, so in chapter 7, verse 12, he said, um, where there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. So he's talked about the change of the priesthood. He's talked about the movement of worship from the earthly tabernacle, which is just a shadow and a copy to the true heavenly tabernacle mm -hmm. where Jesus' sacrifice is presented directly before God the Father. And so since he has argued there's a tight coupling of priesthood and law, which in fact is, is I think, indisputable, there is a tight coupling between priesthood and law. There has to be a new law or a new covenant. He's also picking up on the use of the word covenant, which he first presented in chapter uh, chapter seven, verse 22, where he says, this makes Jesus the surety of a better covenant. What he doesn't do is really prove or focus on the superiority of the um, new covenant here, or really particularly carefully define what the promises are or whatever, he'll do that later. Um, but what he's really picking up on are the faults of the old covenant. So he says, for starts here in, in verse seven, for if that first covenant had been faultless, and so he previously had mentioned some of the faults, 
of the covenant, the mortality of ministering priests. So they die, they have to be replaced by new priests, the necessity of repeated sacrifices for sins, both by priests and people. So although priests are supposed to be holy and set apart, that's really just an external holiness and separation. It's not a genuine holiness and separation that makes them righteous. And, and the really big blow that Levitical priests serve only a copy of the heavenly sanctuary and not the heavenly sanctuary itself in verse chapter eight, verse five. And so going back, he's used Psalm 110 verse four, uh, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek to emphasize the promise of the new priesthood. And so he's argued that because of the tight coupling of priesthood and law, a new priesthood must also usher in a new covenant. And so here with his passage from Jeremiah, he's focusing on the Old Testament promise of a new covenant, as well as more of what's wrong with the Old Covenant. Then we have uh, in verse 8, and this is disputed. Mm -hmm. Or he finds fault with them when he says, is what my translation reads. Does anyone else's have anything different? Everyone has them. So most translations probably say them. I looked at new revised stand. I have this. I have revised standard version that says them. New revised standard says them. Um, the uh, New American Bible has them. Mm -hmm. But he finds fault with them. Yeah. And the New American Standard Bible has them. So the problem is that the word translated as them is in the original manuscripts is um, evenly divided between dative and accusative. Between what? Dative and accusative. Oh, okay. So, and in many of the earliest manuscripts, it's dative. So the problem, so then how does that affect the translation? If it's accused, if it's accusative, he finds fault with them when he says is the correct translation. If it's dative, or he finds fault when he says to them is the correct translation. So there's a question of which one is the original one and which one makes the most sense. The translation committees have typically voted for the accusative. But there's an equally good case to be made, or I would think, actually, I would think, and I, and I, I'm not a, I'm phrasing this as if I'm uncertain. The strongest case is to be made for it to be data. Mm -hmm. So he's saying it to them. In my opinion. So instead of applying it to the Old Testament people, he's talking to the people of his audience. The them becomes his audience. When he mm -hmm. says them, it's the right. current audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, he's talking about faults of 
the entire context of the covenant. So covenant itself, people, um, and it's, it's difficult to separate those two. And then also remember going back to the very beginning of Hebrews, remember that's really a very, very first sentence of Hebrews is a really foundational statement that um, in many ways uh, should frame our understanding of salvation history, of the relationship between testaments, of the meaning of Jesus' ministry, and, and, uh, and a whole lot of other things. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the ages. So, speaking through, speaking in many and various ways through the prophets, we, we have this you know, image of the prophets having these like megaphones mm -hmm. or whatever, and you know, God speaks and they faithfully record, but it doesn't really work that way. The message is mediated by the human recipient, and the human recipient is necessarily human. So there is always going to be a loss of fidelity. So remember, Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant, but Christ is faithful as his son. There's a huge difference. The law is given to Moses. He's a servant. He can't be counted on to have complete fidelity because he's human. And indeed, he also was unable to enter the promised land because of his anger and his failure to obey God. And so then Healy poses the question of how could God create a defective covenant? And her argument is that he didn't. It's the people who were, were defective. But if we translate this as being dated, then that resurfaces the problem again. How could God create a defective covenant? Or let's not call it defective. Let's call it transitional. Mm -hmm. How could God create it? Why would God create a transitional covenant? It takes me back to Adam and Eve. <laughs> and you know, he had a plan there, but I think he knew it wasn't going to really work, but he wanted to give, you know, see what man would do, humans would do. And then the covenant. So those commandments were written in stone rather than in our hearts. But it's how they were enacted that became the problem. Again, it's the humans involved. Well, although you know, she cites Deuteronomy about you know the the law should be written in hearts, and uh, two of the verses in Proverbs also say the same thing. You know, the, the basic fact that the covenant is that the law is on stone tablets, that the law is in stone, that it was given in stone tablets even before golden calf, and then was certainly given in stone tablets after the, the golden calf. And at that point, the, the second iteration represents those stone tablets represent the hardness of the Israelites' hearts. <clears throat> 
a useful, I think, kind of way of looking at this is to look at it as a transitional step in salvation history, not a permanent step in salvation history. So it's not that God created a defective co covenant. He created an imperfect covenant that would lead to a perfect covenant. Imperfect transitional covenant, okay. Yeah, because the problem is that if God created a perfect covenant, Well, think about the context. What would be necessary for God to create a perfect covenant in leading the Israelites out of slavery, bondage in Egypt? Well, they would have had to have acted perfectly and followed all of his expectations. Right. Obedience would have had to have been imposed on them. Mm -hmm. And what's wrong with that? It's not done out of love then, it's imposed. It's imposed, right? So the impetus for the covenant comes from God as an act of love that's true of both the old covenant and the new covenant but remember the critical thing in typology is context let's take a look at romans i think that paul's argument really helps us to kind of understand the difference between no covenant old covenant and new covenant is starting in verse four through verse 10. Likewise, my brethren, you have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may, may bear fruit for God. While, while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I should not have known sin. I should not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, finding opportunity in the commandment, wrought in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The very commandment which promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, finding opportunity in the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin working death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. We can stop there. The gist is <laughs> that without the law, there's no knowledge of sin. And without the knowledge of sin, one can't be you know, convicted of being sinful. And so the law brings knowledge of sin, but it has no effective means of bringing about genuine forgiveness for sin 
for God's people as a whole. So that's what's what Paul is saying. So in that sense, we have the law of bringing about knowledge of sin. It brings about a sense of the holiness of God. It brings about a sense of the otherness of God. That gives credence to the word transitional then. Mm -hmm. Knowledge of sin, holiness of God, otherness of God brings about a sense of the people of God. And so, you know, in some sense, one can argue probably that Melchizedek was an early monotheist. And, you know, early monotheists hadn't necessarily been formed into a people of God. They were individual monotheists, people who, for some reason or another, had rejected the, the polytheistic culture uh, within which they lived in favor of one God. And by default, that one God would be seen as Yahweh. And then I'm sure one can, you know, sort of add other kind of you know, major attributes that the law instilled and is was responsible for that point forward to perfection in the new covenant or what the author describes as perfection for the law made nothing perfect but on the whole, I, I think that it's not true that he finds fault with them. He finds, he sees limitations in the law and the people obeying the law, uh, both of which you know, are significant because they point forward to the new covenant. And so the author is, is and we can discuss this next week since I think we're out of time once again. But the author is is you know using once again drawing on typology here, although he's not you know making this use of a typology explicit. Is this helpful? Yes. Especially the idea of transitioning from one to the next. And why? Yeah. Yeah, and we'll and we'll we'll discuss that again next week along with typology and eschatology and uh, uh, this this section is very very eschatological. <clears throat>